person like Leonardo da Vinci. He did everything but paint pictures. He wrote a lot and he uh, dabbled in, in a lot of engineering. Uh, and he made a lot of inventions. Uh, for example, he invented the cow catcher, which sits in front of a locomotive and pushes the cows gently off the tracks instead of making hammer. He uh, invented the ophthalmoscope that doctors used to look in our eyes. He invented a mechanical black box to record vibrations and speeds and everything in locomotives, but not locomotives, in train trucks, uh, the wheels of, of, of train cars. And he invented a semaphore system for um, lighthouse keepers to communicate with ships at sea. So he's a pretty widespread inventor as well as a mathematician. Uh, he had kind of a geeky personality, and I'll describe that in a little while too. But um, he, he was a, quite a prolific Renaissance person. Well, in the 1820s, he and a mathematical colleague were looking at books like this. This is uh, my book from college up until the 1980s. Every engineer and scientist had to have a book of mathematical tables. We didn't have computers on our desks or on our hips. We had to look up answers to logarithmic functions and trigonometric functions and all that stuff was in this book. Uh, the books were made by people doing calculations. It turns out that every function in this book can be represented with a very close approximation if you're a math major, you can find something called a polynomial equation, which approximates any function in this book. A logarithmic function, a trigonometric function, even a multiplication table. Well, um, there's a way to solve polynomial equations. Uh, they have high exponents and multiplies and divides in them, and it's hard to do that tediously. But um, there's an easy way, too, called the method of finite differences, which we'll explain in a little while. But it requires only addition. No raising things to the powers or no um, multiplying and dividing, just adding. And that's the method that most of the human computers use to, be, to come up with the answers in these books. Well, Babbage and his colleague were comparing books that were published by different publishers for the same function. What do you think they found? Differences. They didn't know which one was right or wrong, they had to figure that out. <laughs> but, and then really bothered Babbage that the books had so many errors in them. Now, how'd the errors get there? Certainly, with only addition, somebody could make an addition error. And when you copy down the answer and send it off to the printing department, you could copy it down and wrong. And when it got to the printing department, the people there were used movable typeset functions. And they could make a mistake. You could transpose a letter or turn a six upside down to a nine. And there were errors in this book all over the place. Well, it bothered Babbage immensely. He knew that engineers and uh, scientists were using this thing to navigate ships, to build bridges and buildings. And if there's an error in the book, the ship could get lost and crash, or the building could, or the bridge could fall down. There was lives and capital at risk because of these errors. And it just bothered the heck out of the map. And he said, this cries out for steam. And what does that mean? Not really steam. It means it's a metaphor for the industrial revolution. It cries out to be mechanized without human error. So he put his mind to making a machine which could do the adding of the finite difference method. And not only that, do automatic transcription, so you don't make errors copying it down, and automatic typesetting. So there's no human intervention to get up from thinking of the, fu of the function to printing out the table. Well, he put his mind to it, and, after, and this was in the late 1820s by now, or early 1830s, and um, he had a design for it, which he called his difference engine. It was a magnificent big design, much bigger than what's behind me. It had 25,000 parts, all of which would have had to be handmade. In the 1820s, there was no, um, no standards for how to make parts all the same size, no standards for screw threads or any of that kind of stuff, you had to do that by hand with a, 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 a lathe and a file. Uh, so he needed the best machinist in the country. He didn't have enough money to make 25,000 parts or hire the best machinist. Uh, he, even though he was a fairly wealthy guy, he didn't have that much money. So there were no venture capitalists, <coughs> which is what inventors use today to, to fund their good ideas. Um, there were no corporate sponsors. So he went to the funder of last resort. Who's that? Anybody? The government, he says. I asked a question a few weeks ago, and somebody said, Mom and Dad. <laughs> anyway, he went to the government, and he told his story about ships getting
getting lost at sea and building the bridges falling down, and they said, Charlie, you've got a good idea. We will fund you to build your different thing. Took his money, went out, and he found the best machinist in the country, and they started making parts. Well, after eight or ten years, they had a, almost half the parts done, and a couple things happened. I told you that uh, Mr. Babbage was a bit of a curmudgeon and a geek. I can give you an example of his personality. He criticized a lot of things, and he got he made a lot of people angry. If you agreed with him technically, he would have you over to his house and have parties and show you his little model of his difference engine. You could crank it and see that it made answers. But if you disagreed with him te um, technically, he would flame you in public. You can't do that with Facebook in the 1820s or 30s, but you could send letters to the editor, and that's what he did. He also sent letters to people and would flame them that way. Here's a letter, an excerpt from a letter he sent to one of his contemporaries, Alfred Lord Tennyson. You may have heard of him in high school, a famous poet at the time. He wrote to Tennyson, Sir, in your otherwise beautiful poem, The Vision of Sin, there is a verse which reads, Every moment dies a man, every moment one is born. It must be manifest that if this were true, the population of the world would be at a standstill. I would suggest that in the next edition of your poem, you have it read, Every moment dies a man, every moment one in one sixteenth is born. <laughs> not very good iambic pentameter, and it did not endear him to Lord Tennyson. <laughs> well, similarly, he got in a fight with his chief machinist. It was over an issue of, of uh, <coughs> location. He wanted the machinist to move his shop closer to him, his to tend to a Babbage's home, so he didn't have to run all the way across London to the industrial zone. The machinist didn't want to do that, and he ultimately up and quit. Took all his tooling with him. So that kind of stalled the, pro the, the progress a lot when they only had half the parts done. At the same time, it was eight or ten years into the project, and the government was getting impatient. They called in Babbage and they said, Charlie, we've, um, we've given you enough money to build several steam locomotives. We need those locomotives, but what do we have from you? Only a pile of parts. We're cutting you off. Well, this devastated Babbage. He was very disappointed, but he took it in stride, and he was not completely daunted. At that time, he put his Babbage difference engine pr uh, plans on the shelf, and he started making what he thought was a much better machine that could do more than just add. It could add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and it could uh, manage the, uh, the, take the results of that and use it to decide what to do next. And it could figure out a sequence of events with a deck of cards that had holes punched in them. Sounds like a computer to me. And it would have been a computer could he, had he ever built it. Uh, he could not afford to build that one either. He called that the analytical engine. And it would have been about the size of a locomotive. Uh, he tried the government, but of course they turned him down to fund it, so he never did build the analytical engine, but he spent several years designing it and describing it to his friends at his party. One of whose friends, uh, I'll tell you a little bit later about it, was a young woman called Ada Lovelace. And uh, she was a math kind of person and really appreciated what he was doing. Anyway, I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Um, the history lesson is almost over now. In the process of developing the plans for the analytical engine, he came on an idea to greatly simplify his difference engine. So he could make a version of it with only 8,000 parts. Um, so he put his mind to that now, by now it's in the 1840s, and he designed up difference engine number two, with many fewer parts and great simplification of the original design. And uh, the net result of that was he had a whole set of de uh, de detailed plans, and he took them to the government. He said, look, I owe you a difference engine. I can build it now much quicker and easier than I could the first time. Will you fund it? And they said, get out of here. <laughs> they did not fund it to build it said, every engine number two. So he figured out that he's never going to get any of his engines built. He put his plans all on the shelf, and that was the end of the old part of the history lesson. We fast forward now to the 1980s. The London Science Museum had inherited from the Babbage estate all of those plans and the model of the first engine. And uh, a new curator there, uh, Dr. Doran Swade, knew about the Babbage engine a little bit, and he knew they had the plans, and he said, you know what? I wonder if it would have worked if he could have built it. Let's try to build it and see. And 
So um, he had the same problem that Babbage did. Where's he going to get money? <laughs> he worked in a museum. Museums never have enough money. There's a donation box out front, they do. Anyway, um, he got some money from corporate sponsors. And he set about building difference engine number two, the simplified version. Um, that was in 1985. So it was 140 years after, almost 140 years after Babbage had designed it and not built it. But they had the model of the first difference engine and they used that for uh, guidance on the materials and the tolerances that could be achieved by machining in those days. And they made sure that they used the same materials and tolerances to build their version of difference engine number two. Um, by 1991, five or six years after they started, two things happened. One is they ran out of money. <laughs> and so they had completed at that time the control section and the calculating section. <coughs> and they did not have enough money to do what Babbage would have thought was the most important thing, the printer stereotype. I'll tell you more about each of those in a minute. Uh, the second thing that happened was it was Babbage's birthday. It was 200 years old. It would have been, he was born in 1791. So they had a birthday party for him. And they cranked his engine, and it got the right answers and vindicated his design. Well, we fast forward to the end of the history lesson a few years later, the mid 1990s. The, the, the half done or two thirds done engine had been at the London Science Museum and occasionally demonstrated. And at that time, there was a marketing event for a company you may have heard of called Microsoft in London. And the president of Microsoft, Bill Gates, was there for the marketing event. And as part of his trip to London, he went to the Science Museum. And he saw the Babbage Difference Engine and liked it. And Doris Sway, the curator, saw him liking it and knew a good thing when he saw it. And he asked, uh, he asked Bill Gates, would the Microsoft Foundation, there was no, not yet a Gates Foundation, would the Microsoft Foundation like to fund us to build a printer? He said, I don't know, I'll go back and ask. And the answer came back, sorry, the foundation does not invest in things like that. But we have somebody that may help you. There was a recently retired Microsoft executive, Mr. Um, Nathan Mirable. He had been the company's chief technical officer since its beginning. And he retired in his 40s with several billion dollars of Microsoft wealth and became a philanthropist and an, a, a collector. He's quite a collector. I'm told that he has a T Rex skeleton in his living room. And he's got a piece of the ENIAC computer like we have out at our museum here. How he got that, I don't know, but if you have enough billions of dollars, you can get a lot of things. Anyway, here's a photograph of Nathan Mervis that he's taken recently. One of his uh, current interests is uh, scientific cooking. And what you're seeing here is the mad scientist in his kitchen. This is what he uses to cook food. So he's quite a uh, Renaissance man himself. Well, ultimately, he agreed to fund the museum, the science museum, to build the printer on one condition. The condition was that they build a second copy of the whole machine for his collection. They couldn't produce an offer. They, started, they took his money and by 2002 they had completed the printer and it worked. And they immediately started building serial number two for Mr. Mirvold. They completed that in 2008. Only six years instead of 17 years. So the learning curve was in place. If you want to order one yourself they can probably get it for you in two or three years. Anyway, um, in 2008, this thing left the London Science Museum. <coughs> this is Nathan Merbold's machine, and he has been kind enough to let us borrow it from him for the time being. We ask every year, can we have it another year? And so far, he's been saying yes, but ultimately, he said he's going to bring it all the way up to his house in, uh, in Seattle and set it up in his living room. I think one of the reasons we have it is his living room wasn't strong enough originally. This thing weighs five tons. <laughs> anyway, that is the story of why there is such a machine um, and how it came to be built originally in, in 130 or 40 years after it was designed and why we have one behind us, behind me.